erupted in one building, and because of those winds, it just pushed that fire. It spread that fire to to uh, several other buildings. If I'm not mistaken, there were three buildings. So, um, can you pan that camera over to the other side where that second fire is now started? Can you tell us a little bit more about that one? Well, yeah. Calvin DeMond is on the camera here. We're going to uh, pan over the glow in the sky. It's hard to see it from this area, but that's the glow in the sky. That may be another fire working over there. And then over in this direction, you can you can really see it from here. Mm -hmm. uh, the glow in the sky in that direction, we think, uh, and this is what some of the members of the FDNY here at least are telling me, they think these are other fires that have developed. Maybe uh, uh, power lines down, on homes, we don't know, but uh, something serious developing over there as well. And again, firefighters can't get to these situations right now because uh, obviously you're dealing with the, the storm, you're dealing with high water in some cases, even though right here in this intersection, and we're at 116 and Rockaway Beach Boulevard, the water has receded quite a bit and perhaps the rest of this area is seeing the same thing and that may make it easier for first responders to reach some of these fire situations before they spread. And Jeff, you just have to really commend these firefighters and first responders who are out there. They are just being taxed with all of the elements. They have been working nonstop and, and certainly under these type of situations where they are scaling buildings, they are climbing in through They're windows. They're going through boats. It's very good they rescued those 30 or 40 people, Jeff, but you know, these firefighters want to put out a fire and they weren't able to do that. And I know that's got to gnaw at them. Well, it is frustrating for them. They, they do, they want to save people uh, and they're hampered by the weather out here. But through it all, uh, member, members of the specialized unit, they saved as many people as they could. And they think they got everybody that they needed to out and away from this fire situation over here. But they uh, were in a situation where, uh, you know, they had to wade through the water. They were in these boats. And as you mentioned, scaling buildings, climbing through windows to get to some of these folks who were trapped in their homes, couldn't get out, really had nowhere to go. Um, so really watching this unfold, and we've been here with them for the last several hours. So watching this unfold has been truly remarkable as they deal with these elements tonight. All right, Jeff, we got to keep this going because we do want to keep keep tabs on what's happening to these buildings. That fire we we're looking at was a video from earlier tonight when the water was deeper and the winds were much more fierce. Uh, and as you can see, the firefighters, as Jeff described it, took to boat the special SOC, the SOC unit. Um, there were those on the back of a fire truck, wading through that water, trying to get in there. We saw several fire trucks tonight, Jeff, backing up throughout uh, throughout our coverage, uh, where they were just unable to get through through flooded flooded streets. And this one looked like it was. Uh, you can't see it there, but we're looking at one of the fire trucks that actually got through. Uh, but some of these firefighters went through in boats. Uh, were able to rescue these people, and that's the good news. Uh, no one died in this in this uh, in this in these fires. That's the best news of the night, Jeff. Well, it, it, it certainly is good news, and I, I've talked to some of these members of the SOC units. Uh, they're uh, definitely encouraged by what they've been able to accomplish here tonight because, really, the conditions out here, um, you know, let me go back a little bit. We've heard over the last several days city officials say evacuate now because it could get to a situation where first responders can't reach you. Well, this was one of those situations. Um, this fire started burning. Uh, the first responders who just happened to be here because we were all sort of trapped here. We were here with these uh, members of the FDNY as well as members of the NYPD. We were trapped here because of the way the water came in at high tide. But as that was happening, they noticed this fire developing. And again, maybe it was a, a down power line or something that sparked it. Uh, and they jumped into action. We saw them grabbing rope. We saw them uh, putting, uh, grabbing a, a boat uh, off of um, off of uh, the back of one of their fire engines that was in this intersection, and they went into action, went right down there, and tried to get as many people as they could out of their homes. Okay, Jeff Pagaz at Rockaway Park. Just an amazing story unfolded. Uh, two separate fires. Uh, great work out there, Jeff.
dozens of people rescued by the fire department, mm -hmm. uh, the SOC unit, and uh, and nobody got hurt or uh, that we know of, and certainly no one died, and that's the great news. So Jeff Begay is doing some great reporting out there at Rockway Park, Queens. We now want to go to another dramatic scene. We want to go back to Kimberly Richardson at NYU Langone Medical Center, where they lost power, pack up, backup generators failed, and they are now moving patients. Uh, Kimberly, what is the latest there now? I know earlier you brought us these uh, dramatic pictures of these young children, one an infant, one a, a small child being transported. Yes. Yes. I've been, I've been standing here and I want to get right to the video that we shot in the last half hour. This is what we've seen. I've been out here, I don't know, about a half hour, 40 minutes. I've seen a, at least a dozen uh, patients come out on stretchers. It seems to be a mixed bag in terms of conditions. Some did have a lot of equipments, obviously IV bags, oxygen tanks. I did see another small child. Others didn't seem to be in too serious situation. They are all coming down. They at least have at least have one nurse, some have two. There are at least three paramedics in the ambulance. I've seen some family family members actually coming out of the lobby of the hospital, walking to walking to the ambulance as they load uh, uh, these patients into into the hospital. Come back live here. Here's an ambulance now that just took off. I want to show you. It's like a uh, caravan of ambulances up First Avenue. As one leaves, another one comes down. They go up First Avenue around the corner to 30th Street, and I'm sure they reach all the way by this time to 2nd Avenue. I would say there are at least three dozen ambulances right now. One just left. There's one coming down coming right at us. They come up, they pull up in the circular driveway here in front of the hospital, which actually has an overhang, so it's not too bad. They pull up right here, they bring the folks out on stretchers, and then they load them. Here's one coming in the circular driveway and loading them into the uh, ambulance. As you can see, also, a, a pretty large contingent of media now here. I'm um, trying to capture this and trying to get as much information we see ca as we can. At this point, as you can imagine, this hospital has its hands full. So we have not been able to talk to anybody officially from the hospital. What I did over here, in terms of where are these patients going, I did hear one paramedic say they are taking. One woman was taking to Mount Sinai Medical Center. But again, not much information coming from the hospital yet. We understand it's roughly 215 patients yeah. that are being loaded out of here and transferred to other hospitals. Social media, Kim. Social, social media playing a big role, Kim. Uh, the first oh. tweets we got about this happening okay. was from people tweeting okay. us and saying, mm -hmm. hey, there's an evacuation going on. Uh, similarly, we got a tweet from someone who had been called by Sloan Kettering saying, Get in here. We got a, a people. Uh, the evacuation of NYU Langone Medical Center. We got to take patients in. So that's where we believe many of them went. You said Mount Sinai. Well, we, we also heard Sloan Kettering. Well, that's what's so fascinating. Nowadays, it's a two-way street. We count on our viewers as much as they count on us. Um, again, here's NYPD, or is this NYPD or FDNY? That is an ambulance. Um, We're told the FDNY has services. been assisting Kim. I'm sorry, one more time, we Bill? We told the, these are private ambulances assisted by the FDNY. That's what we've been told. Yes, here, here's one now with lights and signals uh, blaring up First Avenue. Okay. Just taking see more ambulances coming in. That's uh, FDNY. Yeah. That, one, that one didn't... Oh, interesting. That one didn't stop here at NYU, so... I'm not as sure if that's associated with something else. I'm not going to cross the street like I did before because, as you see, this is a very, First Avenue is very active. There's no traffic, obviously, right now. It's all reserved for emergency vehicles. But over there, again, at the uh, uh, entrance there, Hector, can you poke over here a bit? There's uh, another patient coming out. Let's take that getting picture loaded full into if we an can. Ambulance. Yeah, can you take it full, Hector? So they're now, at this point, they're actually backing these ambulances right up to the front door, the revolving doors. Everybody's in the lobby. There's a large uh, uh, amount of police officers, paramedics also in the lobby here. And again, they're, they're back in these ambulances up to the front door of the medical center. But again, it seems they are getting the folks out, the patients out. Um, with little problem at this point. And Kimberly, I know it's difficult for you to see. Again, you haven't had a chance to speak mm -hmm. with officials, but uh, I'm yeah. sure out of those 250 patients who are being evacuated, some of them have to be under uh, critical care. 
Yeah, and, that, and that's well, one thing I, have, I haven't or right, I been able to talk to any officials, but I have seen with my own eyes, as I mentioned, oxygen tanks. We've seen um, IV, IV bags. We've seen other medical equipment attached with the tubes and all the wires um, um, to these patients. I'm going to step aside. Hector, can you show? This is a, uh, I think this is an FDNY rig coming in here. Lights and sirens. Again, I'm not sure if he's going to pass by, if it's going to stop. But as you see, a very active scene out here. Okay, they are passing by NYU Medical Center going, probably that's truck four we see, FDNY, so maybe going to another scene. So a, a bunch of uh, pieces out here working all at one time. All right, Kim. We're also getting word that there may be some uh, backup power problems at other institutions as well. I don't suppose you've heard anything about that over there, but we're going to keep keep posted. The problem is, of course, when they have these great power outages and flooding as well, um, right. you've got problems with the first with the generator and then second with the backup generator. Um, Kimberly, right. we, we were told yes. that there were a couple dozen ambulances. How many do you see there now? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's more, I would say, I mean, I can just count the ones here on First Avenue before the turn. I'd say there are about 12 just on First Avenue. Now, if you make the right on 30th, which is right over here in that section there, they go all the way down 30th. They're side by side, two rows of those. So, so there has to be, by now, at least 30 more ambulances there on First Avenue. And here's another one leaving right here. This one just took a patient and is taking off. Okay, Kim. So they're picking up, coming in, picking up, coming in. I was just talking about the uh, the other backup generators. We're just getting from ABC mm -hmm. News, tell, uh, city officials telling ABC and WABC as well, Eyewitness News, that that second hospital that with a threat of losing a backup generator that they are worried about uh, is at Bellevue Hospital. Um, so we could have Bellevue, quite a night which, ahead of us okay. with all these people, uh, you know, especially if about a quarter of the people who have left NYU uh, are in some sort of critical care situation. This is a very big deal and an emergency situation, yeah, obviously. Certainly, and somebody is going to be coordinating all of these efforts between all of the hospitals. Uh, everybody's trying right. to get their their patients to, you know, whatever hospital. Well, now we want to break away. We want to go to um, Amy Freeze, who's got the latest on Sandy. Amy. It is almost shocking to see the impacts that the storm is having because this is something that you can't calculate. We could take all the thresholds of past storms, put them on the table, and the impact still wouldn't be uh, forecasted because we've never seen a storm like this before. So that's the reason why we're just having all these incredible breaking news moments of what's happening because this is an unprecedented storm that has uh, affected our entire area, a huge impact across the area. All right, now let's catch up speed on what's happening with the winds. We're starting to see the intensity of the storm decrease. It made landfall um, near Atlantic City just after 8 o'clock with record low pressure, 80 mile an hour winds. Uh, so Sandy goes down in the history books uh, meteorologically for sure. And then of course for weeks to come as we talk about it, but 45 to 50 mile an hour wind gust within the last hour. We're focusing up on what's happening with high tide in a couple of places. Um, some great news right now coming in from Battery Park. The water levels there have receded to below the wall. So below that nine foot splashback, the water is back uh, into the harbor there. So that's the good news. There's another high tide tomorrow, but I think that will be a minor event. Let's go into the storm reports first. Um, coastal flood report coming in for Sayreville. Some police and fire performing rooftop water rescues in that area. So that was at 1040. Um, that's been here within the last hour and 15 minutes that that occurred. Um, roof collapses across the air because of the gusty winds at about nine o'clock in Brooklyn. Uh, Coney Island has had major problems, estimated a surge of at least three or four feet from across or all across Coney Island. So incredible uh, water levels there. Newark Airport. Now that the winds are starting to push out of the southeast, all the water that was uh, at LaGuardia has started to recede. Newark had some major winds come through near 80 miles an hour and uh, this is a LaGuardia report of the water starting to leave the airfield there. JFK also had water issues on the uh, airfield as well. All right, central ice slip, uh, tree blow.
blown over. This is just one of the hundreds and hundreds of reports of uprooted trees. Just incredible damage across the board. This is what's created all the power outages as well. Uh, I think 1.5 million New Yorkers is the latest number for power outages. How much longer do you have to put up with the wind? That's what we're looking at. Right now we have a southeast wind that's going to take us until about 2 o'clock in the morning. Watch how these colors will start to fade into yellow. So right now we're still looking at that uh, tropical storm force 45 mile an hour wind sustained in a lot of places and then gusting in others. Once we get into 2, 3 o'clock, that red fades out of the picture. The winds are going to pull back temporarily to around the 30, 35 mile an hour range. There could be a brief area of intensity just after daybreak tomorrow, and the winds are still going out of the southeast through high tide tomorrow morning. So high tides tonight in coastal Connecticut, and then high tides through about noon tomorrow could be an issue. We'll be watching those very carefully. The problem with coastal Connecticut, Long Island Sound areas, they're not getting the flush out. They're not getting the release of the water like everybody else is right now, allowing the water to come out. So. Uh, we're going to have to see how those water levels work out, and I'll tell you the high tides coming up here next. Still really incredible rain shield across the area as this storm has moved on shore. Uh, it's become a post-extra -tro tropical system, if you will. Um, it has not lost, uh, it didn't lose intensity like typically when a hurricane comes on land. It, it loses the warm waters, and so it starts to fall apart. But this particular storm, Sandy, once it made landfall with hurricane force winds, it joined up with another storm and kept its intensity, and it's still creating just a, a huge impact all the way back into the Great Lakes. They're going to be seeing amazing winds across uh, places like Lake Michigan, where they could have 30-foot lakefront winds. Uh, rain bands. Let's get into the rain and see what's happening there. Starting to see it settle down in Jersey as that last little wave has come on shore. The yellows, of course, indicate the heaviest rain that we're seeing across the area, and even the rain bands that have moved into Jersey within the last 30 minutes are starting to subside. A moderate rain shower over New York, stretching up into Manhattan. That'll go over into Jersey. We're expecting that little branch right there, those little uh, spokes to continue here for maybe another 30, 40 minutes, but the winds still pushing on shore. Long Island, not a lot of rain for you right now. Coastal Connecticut, not a lot of rain, but we're looking at the high tide times right now. Kings Point, looking at the water levels, I think you're in a minimum to moderate situation. Same thing with Mamaroneck, minor to moderate. They don't have a tide gauge there, but just around midnight will be your high tide. I don't see major problems there, but you're right on the border, so a moderate situation to watch out for. The questionable high tides will be Bridgeport uh, and Stanford. Earlier forecasts were for major tidal flooding in these locations. I think we can pull back to moderate. It depends on how the water has pulled back. If, if the storm had hit later and we were at a high storm surge, I think the surge is pulling back just a little bit in some of these locations and the water levels look decent as we approach this astronomical high tide, the tide occurring at full moon. By tomorrow morning, we already know the water levels are back down in the battery, so 907, a minimum to moderate impact. We could have splash right up against the wall, uh, similar to how we had yesterday morning. Jamaica Bay, uh, 980 minimum to moderate uh, there as well. But water has been such a huge issue and a lot of the damage has already been done. We just have to get through this next 12 hour cycle of the high tides before we can really um, sort of rest assured that the water levels are going to be coming down from here on out. On the future cast overnight tonight, there's still a bit of a spin here, so we could see winds in the city in 40, 45 mile an hour range all the way through early tomorrow morning. We may have some gust in spots up to 50, 55 miles an hour, but it won't be the widespread intense wind that we've seen with the storm uh, in the past couple of hours. Instead, we're going to be on the back end of things, less intensity. By 2 o'clock tomorrow, still some rain bands in the area. It'll be lighter rain and the wind will start to pull back about 3 or 4 o'clock tomorrow during the afternoon. And, and these winds will be lighter, but still gusty breezes coming in at times. Um, interesting to note here on the future cast, the snow has just been cranking in the Virginias on the back side of the storm. They've already had a foot of snow um, in the Virginias from the storm system. So the incredible intensity stretching uh, well inland from what we've seen. By Wednesday at 1 o'clock, we've just got clouds in the area and we're looking at major cleanup across the area. Area. Here's the latest on a buoy. Uh, this water temperature at 60 degrees. This is uh, from Kings Point, and the winds are gusting there at 41 miles an hour out of the east southeast, and that's going to take some of the water out there of that back bay and uh, provide some relief for them. Here's the planning forecast to give you an idea of what's ahead. By 6 a.m. tomorrow, we have some showers in the area. It's windy. Temperatures are in the upper 50s. And then by about 10 a.m. mid-morning, the winds could still be gusting southeast 30 to 50 miles an hour. And by the afternoon, we'll start to see the winds 
settle down. Still a spotty shower in places, but a lot of relief coming in the form of these winds starting to taper as early as tonight. I won't say we're completely out of the woods, but the worst of it, the most intense yeah. winds, are certainly over. Amy Freeze with a complete six-minute AccuWeather <laughs> forecast. You didn't miss a beat and you didn't stop once. And a very impressive, uh, good roundup of everything that happened tonight. Amy, thank you she very much. Uh, we want to show you uh, uh, one of the more remarkable pictures, still pictures that mm -hmm. we we saw tonight. This is in Hoboken. Uh, well, we're not going to see. We're going to see Lucy, who has one of the more remarkable pictures at the Path Train. She's in Hoboken for us, Lucy. Well, Bill, we are outside the Hoboken Path train station, and tonight Sandy made a joke of those sandbags outside the entrance. The station was completely flooded this evening. In fact, Hoboken officials report this was the worst flooding the city has experienced in almost 200 years. It's too early to say just how much property damage was created by all the flooding and the intangibles, how many sentimental items were lost, how many lives affected and driving through the streets. I can tell you it is eerily quiet and dark. We're just about the only ones roaming around. The others are those tireless rescue workers who have been going up and down the city streets trying to help people in trouble, trying to make sure things are as best as they can be under these circumstances. We're talking all the firefighters, police, sheriffs, rescue workers, emergency medical technicians. Now, earlier we were in Weehawk and where all that, that whole core of rescue workers did an amazing job getting people out of their flooded homes. For some, it was quite a harrowing experience leaving their houses. Some of them were submerged under the water and trying to escape, but they were all evacuated safely. This was on Chestnut Street that we saw some of these amazing rescues. And um, if we're rolling the video right now, take a look out for one woman that rescue workers took out of her home in a Halloween coffin decoration. Yes, we note the irony there. And if we have some uh, interviews from the people who were rescued, let's go to that tape. I was scared that I was gonna drown. It was it was just crazy. I had a hard time getting to my uh, out of my house. Water went up to your neck. Yeah, the water went up to my neck. Sometimes it went over my head. We had to go out the second the story window. These guys helped us down from the the, the second part of the roof. Okay, these are the very people officials try to encourage and uh, cajole to get out of their homes to evacuate, but so many felt they could ride this out, felt they could survive Sandy as they had survived the last hurricane. But unfortunately, the waters just came in so fast, so high that rescue workers were forced to do emergency rescues this evening. So that is the very latest from Hoboken. I'm Lucy Yang for Channel 7 Eyewitness News. And Lucy, we're just looking at the picture behind you. Look at that tape. Look at all of that. Uh, the, I don't know. What is that what behind is that, you? Lucy? <laughs> Those are sandbags under Those the are... tape. But yeah. the Port Authority released a photo earlier this evening of the flooding inside the station, which showed the flooding came from within. So those sandbags did nothing to stop the water from the outside going in. That's an elevator in. door, From Lucy. the inside. Yeah. Yeah, Lucy, is, we're, we're, we're taking a look at that picture uh, that we had earlier okay. of a flooded pass station in Hoboken, and we can just see yes. that water rushing into the station. From the elevator door. Yes. Yes, it was gushing in, so it was coming in from every corner. So these sandbags, they tried, but you know what? That really did nothing tonight. And further down River Street, there are barricades all over Hoboken tonight, big, heavy barricades. They have just been left all over the place, just tossed all over. It's a mess here. When daylight comes, we'll be able to show you much better just what a mess these streets are. And for all the people who put out garbage thinking it might be picked up tomorrow, that garbage is all over the street as well. Yeah, that, that's a really good point because a lot of the people who are walking, uh, average citizens and firefighters, walking in that deep water, you don't know what you're getting yourself into or what kind of garbage you are uh, actually coming in contact with. This has been quite a night. Lucy Yang, thank you very much from Hoboken. Um, this has been an amazing night from the south shore of New Jersey mm -hmm. where we saw amazing uh, just torrential rains pounding our reporters and the shoreline uh, to Hoboken, uh, to Westchester County, out to Long Island, Island, and then uh, the, the the kind of storm surge that we did not think would happen with this kind of with this with this particular hurricane, the storm surge up to 
in Manhattan, the lower Manhattan, wiping out power up to 39th Street in Manhattan, river to river, and flooding the subway system. It has been just a, a disaster of a night. Uh, fortunately, more has. people have not been killed, and that's the good news, but it's, it's so sad that anyone was killed in our area too. And we've also been going back and forth with Kimberly Richardson, talking about that dramatic situation being pr played out at NYU Lagone Medical Center, which we uh, are, again, we are hearing that power was out. They had to resort to backup generators, and some of those patients being shuffled to other hospitals. Then we also heard Bellevue Hospital experiencing the same situation. We now have on the phone um, Dr. Jay Allersberg, who has been able to talk to some of the officials there about how this is now being played out and how they are orchestrating these uh, patients from hospital to hospital. Jay, what can you tell us? Well, Sade, I haven't been able specifically to talk to the people at NYU, but, uh, uh, but I know a couple of things. One, uh, Bellevue Hospital is administered in part by NYU. Certainly, NYU uses Bellevue as a teaching hospital. So the two of them probably have some communication with one another. Uh, if there is a problem at Bellevue that develops that will require um, evacuation to another facility. Uh, with some of the problems that are being faced uh, in terms of, a, of an evacuation, uh, well, they're, they're, they're multiple. Evacuations uh, generally are set up to deal with such things as natural disasters, tornadoes, earthquakes, and hurricanes. But you might be surprised to learn, maybe not in New York City, that only about 14% of evacuations for natural disasters are from hurricanes Natu in our area particularly because not a lot of uh, these storms blow up the east coast and get to new york city but when a hospital is faced with this kind of uh, 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 emergency they have plans generally for how to get things moving how to evacuate patients one of the first things is how do you get patients from nyu langone for example to uh, Mount Sinai to uh, New York Presbyterian to uh, Sloan Kettering nearby hospitals. It, it's, it's a situation where transportation has to be called in. These are all things that are done in advance and the hospital staff knows exactly what to do. They're trained, uh, especially the administrators in a situation like this at uh, 12, 15 uh, a.m. There are administrators at the hospital who go through training so they know exactly what to do. How to get patients down from the upstairs floors in no a hospital. Elevators. How, exactly. No how, do they, how do they get them down without elevators? Do they have specific generators set up so that the elevators work? What but do they do? Jay, Jay, the backup generators uh, went down. This was a perfect storm of, of, of disasters for them as we look at uh, blacked out lower Manhattan still from the Brooklyn side. This was a perfect storm of, of disasters because the backup generators failed uh, and it didn't just fail on the, uh, in isolation. This was during a hurricane in New York City so you couldn't have a lot of people getting there quickly. They had to wait for all these ambulances to get here. I just have never heard of anything like that happening before. And what about staff, Bill? What about the, uh, this is um, uh, the, the end of, a, essentially, the end of a weekend. Do you, have, do you have your full hospital team there, all the nurses, all the nurses' aides, to help patients, especially in a disaster like this? Listen, NYU and Bellevue are sitting pretty much on the water. I mean, they are on the water. They're just a, they're just a little bit west of the FDR. And they're it's sitting fun. right around the locations where we were uh, broadcasting from, where we could see out into the harbor. Uh, at, we, we saw that guy on the jet ski a little bit uh, a while ago. He was right on the water, I would say, no more than 500 feet from NYU and Bellevue. So that's why they're in this situation. They're right on the water, right at the level of the FDR. And if they're generators, I assume they are in the basement, they're going to get wiped out as soon as the water starts lapping over the um, uh, over the uh, cement barriers. And Jay, right now we're looking at some of the video of, of the patients being transported, and I'm sure uh, there are many patients there who are in critical care. Can you talk about um, what's involved in dealing with these type of patients? Because you, you certainly don't want to move a patient like this unless you have to, and that's